Amen. Good morning. Wow. Happy 14 years, church. That is awesome. That is awesome. I'll tell you what, I am so excited. And it is amazing. First off, how these years have flown by. Anybody remember our very first day? Anybody, anybody there? Look at that. Anybody remember when I had a full head of hair? Anybody remember that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not jealous and I'm not bitter. I see all those beautiful full heads of hair out there. Today we're going to do something different. You don't even have to take notes today. Today I'm going to be your tour guide. Okay, we're just going to, I'm going to talk from my heart. We're going to have a little fireside chat with Pastor Matt. We're going to be real relaxed, real laid back. I'm going to take you all the way back to the beginning. I thought it would be fun to start with looking at our very first logo and our top five rejected slogans. The slogans that were this close to making it as part of who we are, but thankfully they did not end up being our thing. Because this is, once we settled on the name, we needed a good slogan, right? We needed to, to move forward. And we found the potter's hand and we knew with the Rumleys and the Mitchells huddled together over in Myrtle Beach and we came up with the potter's hand and based on Jeremiah 18, 6 and how amazing it was gonna be, from then, it was trying to get people to find where we were. So we came up with a logo. Our first one was very simple. And by simple, I mean boring. And this is, this is the kind of thing we needed some razzmatazz to help find where we are. In fact, that's what we came up with. The most insanely long slogan in history, we're the church that if you can find us, you get to worship with us. And that was pretty good. We said, you know what, it's too long. That will never fit on a bumper sticker. So we shortened it to this. Good luck finding us. <laughs> that was it. You're going to need it, right? So we started talking to people. We said, you know what? That's, that's just not going to cut it. We got to update. Is there, let's talk to the people. Let's talk to the young ones, right? Because the young ones are, man, they got the pulse of the culture. They, they know. Just ask them. They know, right? They're, they're experts on, on everything. They will, they will tell you. So we went and said, is there, any, is there anything that comes to mind when you think Potter's hand? Is there any? Famous people that come to mind. Somebody that can endorse us, maybe. Maybe some celebrity or something. And you know where they went. Without missing a beat, the young ones wanted us to change our name to Harry Potter's Hand Bible Church. <laughs> where the slogan, of course, is where it's always magical. Because it's a magical place at the Potter's Hand. We found something really creative happened here. We asked the older generation, what do you think of when you hear the words Potter's Hand? And without fail, you know what they thought? Because this is the generation that I love that grew up watching It's a Wonderful Life. So they immediately thought of Mr. Potter, the cranky old evil banker. That's not exactly the look we're going for. So we went to the middle-aged generation. We said, what do you think of when you hear Potter's hand? And you know what they thought of? They thought of Colonel Potter from MASH. <laughs> well, that's, that's not, that, you know what the slogan was? The slogan was this. If you're old and cranky, this is the place for you. We said, that's still not good. That's still not, we're getting closer. But we said, you know, there's, there's some great people here. Some of our senior adults are not cranky. Some of our senior adults are awesome. And they're godly, beautiful people who are humble and gentle and modest. And immediately, I don't know about you, but I think of one person. Yes, I think of the silver fox. I think of Miss Pat. Give her a hand, everybody. And Jim, yeah, you were there. <laughs> and I thought about this, and I said, there has to be a picture. And I, and I asked, Tion, can you guys go look and see, is there a picture of her maybe in, in a nice, modest moment of prayer, a contemplation? Maybe she's leading a group. And, and did we find that one? Did we have that humble picture? There it is. Okay. That's it. Again, not exactly what we were going for. It's a, a little violent, but maybe that was a one-time thing. Surely this doesn't happen ever again. Oh my goodness, so she's an angry elf. This is, these are one of the things that we look at and I said, maybe the senior adults aren't the ones who are gonna come up with our next slogan. We're gonna give Pat a chance to redeem herself. And so I said, Tion, you have got to find, go through our whole database, find a picture to redeem her that shows the, the modest and, and humble side of Pat. If we have something like this, <laughs> there it is, there it is. Here's to you. And for the record, 
I cleared all of this with Miss Pat, okay? <laughs> right? True story. I called her up. I had to slip her a $100 bill, but I did call her up. And she, she agreed that I could show all this. And uh, we love you, Pat and Jim both. You guys are awesome. You wrote it from the beginning. Love you guys. Come on. Awesome. So we moved out of the 90s and into the early 2000s, and we, we kind of got technology to, to, to come with us here, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but we got a new logo, and we started getting on the right track, and this logo, this was good. This was, this was our ode to Planet Hollywood, and as we, as we moved into this, we said we need a slogan that really captures what we are about here, that really epitomizes what you experience the minute you walk in the doors of the potter's hand. And without fail, when we asked the ladies, our new slogan became, Welcome to the Potter's Hand, where the fellowship is warm, but it's always freezing in here. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's right. Thank you, Lord. We are the frozen chosen. <laughs> and then, of course, if you've been here any length of time, you know we finally actually settled on love God, love people. And it has been no looking back ever since. God is doing great things, and, and it is so amazing. From our humble beginnings, back at the very first church we looked at, which was in Cary Christian School down in the basement on that icy morning, and it, <laughs> there's me with my super shiny silky shirt with a full head of hair, looking lost as ever, and it was a great day, and God was moving. In fact, so quickly that we quickly outgrew that. We, we knew that we had hit something, because we wanted to be a little bit different than most of the churches, especially at that time in this era. When we started this back in 03, we wanted this to be a safe place where you could come and bring your problems and your stresses and your concerns and lay them at the feet of Jesus, where you could come and not have to pretend that you got it all going on, where you could come and take your mask off and you could say, you know what? Ain't nobody got it all together. Oh, except one. And that was the one we worship, Jesus. And we wanted to be that place where you could come and no matter what kind of day you had, you would find a warm embrace and a, and a cold room. And you would be able to come and, and get, get that, that koinonia fellowship to fill that void that only Jesus could fill, where we know who is perfect and holy. And it's not us, but we are on a trajectory seeking after that person where you could come and you would find a warm welcome, where we see his word as our guide, where it is that sharp two-edged sword that cuts all the way to the bone and where it does all the judging because that's not our job, where you would be met with love no matter where you are in your journey. Now, you could be safe here, but not safe to stay and remain in your sin. We wanted to have that beautiful balance, that boldness of you are welcome here, but join us to emulate the Savior, where we let him change us, that we are on a journey towards holiness. And that's a word you didn't hear much. And it's one of those things that, man, it's tough. You come, man, my toes get stepped on every week, and I know what's coming. I get to look at this ahead of time, right? And I see this, a safe place where you can grow in faith with your friends, to grow, and, that, and it struck a nerve, because we quickly outgrew this, and we had to move to East Cary Middle School, one of the very few pictures we have of this place. This was kind of a very scary, dark, dungeony cafeteria we met in. And this is back when we used the overhead projectors. And we put the lyrics up, and it'd be upside down and backwards. Is it, you ever tried to play with one of those? It's the exact opposite of what you think. It is so much harder. So don't knock it when lyrics are messed up, okay? It is hard. I try the, you do that. and it, We outgrew this, and we moved again to Reedy Creek elementary. And the hair just keeps getting better and better in these shots. And I think if you zoom in, I think the next shot shows there's somebody hiding behind that. Oh, there she is. Has nothing to do with the sermon. I just like looking at her. I just, so she's right here on the front row, but it's awkward to preach like this. So I won't do that. So there's our keyboard player. She asked me to marry her. So, you know, one of those things. And then that led to our first permanent location where we are today at the potter's hand. And it was a huge blessing to finally have a place where we could sit for a minute and not have to sweat and unload and reload and sweat again and unload and reload and just do all that and burn out our volunteers, burn out our equipment. In fact, I have a photo of that very first service. If you look in the right corner, it even tells you the date, October 24th, 2004. Look how small the screen was at that point, and the walls are still white, and 
Ah, we still have the cross because some things never change. Some things need not change. And it was a magical time. And it brought us up to today, where today we have what I believe is the greatest team on the planet. And it is a joy to serve with them. And God has expanded us, and we've continued to grow. And we have seen hundreds of lives changed, hundreds of people come to know the Lord, so many people baptized, children dedicated, marriages established, broken homes restored, disciples made, missionaries supported, missionaries prayed for and sent out from here all around the world. And God has done amazing things. And I believe even greater things lie ahead of us. Now, I promised you a vision update. And I can't wait to share with you what God has been doing over the last 45 days since I've given you the last update. So for anyone who is new to our church family, let me give you just a brief history. We have been in this current location for 13 years, okay? This is a huge blessing to us, all right? And if you were part of the original crew who had to tear up and, and, and set up and everything every weekend, you know how much of a blessing this was. And if you weren't here last fall when we launched the Embrace the Vision campaign, let me give you the quick recap of where we are to this date. This current facility is leased to us, and it has been great. It has been exactly what we needed when we needed it. When we first started, we had a five-year lease. Then we were offered another five-year lease, and we are about to finish our three-year lease. Okay, that's your total of 13 years. What we did is we met with the landlord, and we rolled into the lease agreement the cost of the upfitting. Okay? This was just a concrete floor and empty shell of a warehouse. It looked like that, except it wasn't even painted black. It was dusty, had no heating, no air, no power, no lights, nothing. Just hard concrete for 12,000 square feet. 6,000 in here and 6,000 square feet back there for education and offices. So we upfitted this, and it was a cost of 530-something thousand dollars. That was a huge chunk, especially for a, a new church. We met with the landlord, and we rolled it into the lease, meaning each additional year that we stayed here, a portion of the upfitting cost would be paid off. It would be forgiven. We would make payments to it, or it would be outright forgiven a little bit more each year. And as of today, we are officially debt-free. There is no debt. It is paid for, okay? That is awesome. That's for you and your faithfulness. We give God the credit. There is no debt other than our operating expenses and our lease payment that's it. And that is a huge thing, and God gets the credit for it. So we have a situation, an exciting crossroads. That three-year lease that was signed just before I became pastor expires this summer, which brings us to the exciting, awesome decisions we are praying about and making, okay? So what we've been doing is we wanted to look at all the options on the table and not limit God in any way. We want to be the best stewards, and your servant leadership team has been praying with us. Everything we did needed to be the best use of God's money, period, bar none. So as we are growing, we started looking. We realized this may not be the final destination. I don't think it was ever intended that. Even back with Dr. Rumley and I were young and starting this together, this was designed to house a certain number of children, a certain number of youth, and a certain number of worshipers. And you can look around, and we are mad. Last week, we set an all-time record since I've been pastor, and that was just on a normal Sunday. And that is awesome. That is a great problem to have. It's a good thing, but I want to walk you through my thinking, knowing that this lease expires this summer, okay? Now, breaking news, one thing you can pray for me is I have been asked to meet with the landlord tomorrow. He has asked for a meeting. And I know exactly what this meeting is going to be about. He wants us to sign another long lease because it helps. It helps them finance more and show that the lease is full and all this. Thing. Every other tenant in here has signed a long-term lease, another five-year lease. Okay? I am very hesitant. I'm, I'm, I'm not even excited to sign a three-year lease. Maybe a one-year lease if that's what God needs us to do as we continue to, to gather our down payment. But pray for this meeting tomorrow because he's going to present several options, and I can't wait to see what he has and bring it back to our team and talk about it. Now, speaking of options, the first option we looked at was expanding our current site. You have to go through all these doors to look at all the options. We looked at renting more space, the bay next door, the bay next door to that, and the bay next door to that. We're already renting the ballet on Sundays for the adults. You may not know that, but a lot of our adults meet next door. The problem is each one of these have signed long-term leases, and they're happy. They don't want to move, and they don't necessarily want to be bought out of a lease, and I get it. I understand that. That's where they've poured in. There. They've done upfitting and stuff, so I get that. So the next option we looked at was could we buy this campus? 
Can we just buy it outright? We're already here. We're established. A lot of people know where we are. <laughs> if you can find us, you can join us. But the landlord is not interested in selling. And I get that. This is their retirement income. This is what they have coming, and they own all this, and, and that's great. I don't blame them a bit. If I was in the real estate business, I would probably do the same thing. I would lease it. So that wasn't necessarily an option, which led us to three remaining options. The first one is find another existing building similar to this that we could hopefully buy, or if not, maybe look at a lease purchase. Within maybe 10 miles of our current site, find a place, another warehouse, another industrial building that we could upfit, that we can move into, that we could tailor make it to our needs as they are today, not necessarily how we thought they might be, say, 13 years ago. So we looked at that. And we realized very quickly there is not much out there that is 20,000 square feet or more, which is what we would need to justify a move. We did find a couple things, a couple giant industrial. One of them was in a zoned area that would never allow a church. The other one was a great place, and I was really excited about it, but he is not interested in working with a church, which kind of hurt because somebody somewhere in his past had burned him. And the minute our realtor mentioned we were a church, the call was over. That's sad. We found another one. We're like, yeah, oh, can we buy this? He says, no, but I'll lease it to you. $30,000 a month. Wow. So it was tough, but God could still do anything. So that's an option we're looking at. A similar thing, but a step up from here, possibly a little bit better location. We looked at that. The next option we looked at was let's look at existing churches. Let's not rule those out. They're even more rare to find than an existing industrial building. Over the last year we've been looking, we have found two that were possible candidates that could handle us. One was in Cary and was completely landlocked and had even less parking than we had and was surrounded by subdivisions, so we couldn't have any loud concerts and only had, I think, 70 parking places. So already you're taking a step back, and it was about $2 million. Then there was another one that I got really excited about when it came across my desk. I was looking, like, oh, this is great, and then I noticed it was three cities away, 45-minute drive down the interstate. I was like, wow, plus it was overpriced. But it could have worked. The building looked great. Could we just move it here? Well, that wasn't an option. But we're still open, and God could do that. Buddy, if he provides in the next six months a ready-to-move-in building, I am all over that. I am okay. I'm okay with that. We can make it work. We can make it look less traditional. If it's scaring away lost people or whatever, move-in ready is always awesome. Then the other option we are continuing to pray about, and I teased it last fall when we talked about this, was purchasing our own land and build a building of our own design, where we finally start paying our mortgage rather than someone else's mortgage. And this is great. The only problem is land is the one thing they're not making any more of. <laughs> it is finite. And if you haven't looked in around town, it's a little pricey. Just a skosh. And I shared just a little bit. If you weren't here, I'll, I'll remind you. We found a, a plot of land across the street that was uh, five acres if you could buy all four parcels. This is behind Dallas, Chicken and Biscuits, and, and Skippers. If you wanted to stay close to where we are. The starting price per acre was almost a quarter million dollars. $200,000, $250,000 per acre. That's just for one. So if we could buy all five, you're looking at almost a million dollars. And we hadn't even put a building on it. Not to mention the fact of how this is zoned, and these are residences that are building back here, and it's, 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 it's tough. The topography is rough. It's not ideal, and it's only five acres, which most experts say you want at least 10 because you're going to need five for your building and parking. Then you need some for runoff, and you need some for the easements and all the logistics. You know how that works. So real quickly, you're already down to a lot. So that's just one. So we looked at how about the Walmart parking right across the street? That's a pretty good location, a lot of visibility. $400,000 an acre. That's crazy. We would be approved to buy two acres, and that's still no building. But again, God could do anything. So we're looking at all kinds of things. We kept our eye on a golf course on a certain road not far from here. And the price continues to not be negotiable. But we're dealing with the realtors and we're talking. And if he will come down and we can make something work, that is an ideal place. And it is still a candidate. We are looking at every, every option. If you're willing to go further down the road and get a little further away from this type area, then the prices drop drastically. Instead of 300,000 an acre, you're looking at 30,000 an acre. Now that's much more doable where you can buy 20 to 30 acres. And I'll show you a little vision of what that could look like, no matter what option God shows us. So no matter what he has for us, I wanna walk you through just a glimpse of the vision that I have for what God could use. And the good news is they will work in any of the three options that God shows us, okay? So as we walk through this vision, let me show you 
what I'm not interested in. I'm not interested in building an empire, building the Taj Mahal, or building some grand cathedral that is a monument to pride. There's plenty of beautiful buildings out there. We don't want to be one more where we have blown all our money and lost people go, couldn't you have helped me pay my bill? Couldn't you have fed the poor or something like that? I don't want to go down that road, okay? So as long as I'm pastor, we are not spending money on imported Italian marble, chandeliers, or gold-plated toilet seats. That is not where it is for us. That is why I was so excited to start the potter's hand with Pastor Rumley because we were going to go a different way. What I'm interested in is something different. I have here on this table, under this blanket, you're going to think it's a, an aquarium full of M&Ms, but that was last week if you missed it. When we first built this building, we decked it out. We went all out with technology and all kinds of, I mean, we lit it up. We, we did it as best we could the right way at that time. Anybody guess what's under here? <laughs> Skittles. A building. No, it's not a model. This. Oh, yes. Oh, glorious day. This is a haze maker, also known as a fog machine. And this is fog juice. Now, when we upfitted this in 04, we had this in mind. And this was running. And we had so many lights, cool lights, laser lights, all kinds of intelligent movies. They were all across the back, all across. And it was awesome. And it was amazing. And it, we were looking at any way we could attract the next generation to church. And it worked for a season. And then every other church started going this way. Every other church was playing hazemakers and, and fog machines and laser lights and Cirque du Soleil dancers spinning on hoops and pyrotechnics. And I mean, it was like a Vegas show to see who could do something bigger and better. And it was pretty cool. Things were flashy and things were, were really blowing and going. And then something clicked. It clicked with me and it clicked with the leadership team. Slowly it began to dawn on us that whatever you use to attract people is exactly what you have to use to keep people. And something started to feel a little showy, a little entertainment-based that didn't quite sit right. And it started gnawing at me. So what happened was, as one of these lights would burn out, we didn't replace it. We took it down. And then we started praying, let them all burn out, Lord. <laughs> Let's let God show up because he is enough. So what we started doing, we started sensing this momentum where every church seemed to be going this way and playing this game that bigger and better. You think that's great. We're going to top last Sunday. Y'all come. And here's the only problem with that. You can't. Man can only manufacture so much. And you can get that in Nashville. And you can get it in Hollywood. And you can get it in Vegas. But what I noticed was we can give people the one thing they can't. And that's Jesus. The real deal. The genuine article. Where, don't get me wrong, I mean, we still have great moments. Sometimes they're, they're powerful moments, like an M&M's thing or a guy wearing a dog collar or something like that. But it's just that. It's a moment. It's not built around this where you are just going crazy. We have stripped everything down to move back to the biblical essentials of Acts chapter 2, where you focus on the gospel and relationships and meeting people's needs and feeding the widows and the orphans and evangelism and missions and discipleship. That's what we move back to because we can sustain that. Because when you present Jesus, he engages people. And that's what we saw. And it started to work. And we see that. We see the fruit of that, this heartfelt, honest, authentic focus. Lives are being changed. So anything we build is not going to be some crazy, wild thing where it is used just one day a week in some big arena. It is going to be a beautiful, well-spent, multi-purpose thing where so many things can happen. Where it's, church is never meant to be this one hour a week. And then it sit just air conditioned and cool by itself. It's supposed to be every day of the week. It doesn't happen here. We're just the, 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 the gathering place for this day. But it happens out there, and, and we can bring the community in, and we can mix and mingle and not only meet your needs and my needs, but also the needs of others. So if you're still with me, we're going to put this back. Hayden, you want to help me roll this out? I am done with the haze maker. Bye, haze maker. Thank you, buddy. If you're still with me, sit back. We're going to dim the lights, and I'm going to walk you through a standard but very possible layout. This is not saying exactly what we'll do, but I just want to paint the picture because a lot of you hadn't, hadn't seen this yet. Where you see here the usual entryway. I'm going to look at just a, just a not that one, but the one before it. Uh, should be an outside building here. Do you have the uh, blue sky shot of a church building there? 
It's something functional, and it's something very tasteful, where you can drive up, and you can see that it has an awning, and you could come and be dropped off, but if uh, you don't have it up there, okay. It's a very simple building, and I, and I showed it maybe in fall, and it is a beautiful thing, but it is simply a, a metal building with stucco and brick and some nice accents. You move inside, and you see just a simple, spacious lobby where you can come and meet, meet people. It's well lit. The area can be gathered, and you can meet with guests, and they can be welcomed, and you can go to the next one and you can see where Shannon will be, where she will be ready to welcome people and move people on. Now, from there, all the simple things that we have, we just wanted to make them more usable day in and day out. So instead of the kids always having to play in the fire ants outside in the heat or in the cold, you come in and this is in a locked place where moms and dads get a security code and the kids can be safe. But it's not just Sunday. It's Monday, it's Tuesday, it's Wednesday. You can come, and this could be a place where homeschoolers can gather. You can come and bring it when your kids are off, and you can come and take your coffee in here, and the kids are safe, but it's open on Sundays as well. Now church is no longer looked at as just one hour a week, but it's a gathering place, a hub, so we can meet other people. And people who may never come to church service may come to a gathering place. From there, you can move to what we would use for our children's wing, which is where we could have children's church, and a few nice things. Notice... This is just polished concrete and exposed rafters. There's no waste here. From here, you can rearrange it, you can play things, you can have your lock-ins or move to the next one. You'll see the potential youth wing where it's very simple, it's clean, it's polished concrete. It's just a beautiful, simple gathering place. From there, you move to the multi-purpose room where we can have worship. Notice it's already set up for Wednesdays. It's already got your tables, it's got your chairs, but it's not just one use. From here, you can clear the chairs, and you can invite people in for refit, for fitness, for the basketball league, for the things that you want to do, for concerts, for having the yard sales, the community events to bring the people in, like our great Christmas giveaway last year where people could come and take what they want for free. And what is this place? I've never seen a church actually care about the community like this and bring them in. But the thing that really excited me was if you notice on the far left, you see this metal rolling door where not only the Wednesday night meals can be served and those who don't have money can still come from our community and have a meal, but if you open it up, you see finally this, our food pantry, where people can come every day, where somebody, probably somebody in this room is willing to help be the person who oversees this, who sees what we're low in, who sees how to ration it out and take that on as a beautiful ministry. And then I began to be reminded of the blessing bags we talked about when I first became pastor, where we would make these bags and we would have them ready in our van, little backpacks of blessing, hand them to somebody who needed it. And then I said, oh, I think the Lord wants us to use this to bless people. And I thought, okay, we'll do the blessing room. And this is the thought just coming to my mind. I'm thinking, all right, how does this look, Lord? I don't understand. Is it, is it something simple? Is it just a foam mattress where we have a blessing bag waiting and somebody could come in maybe during the week and clean the mattresses or take the sheets off? We have great people who would love to minister to people that are anonymous and never get any credit. And then it hit me. You are dreaming too small. We want to do something bigger than this. And I thought, well, you know, that's awesome. That's cool because we're fulfilling the church's mission. And, and I get that, Lord, but what do you want? And he said, you need to dream bigger because there are more needs to meet. And you need to show that you guys practice what you preach, that love God, love people is more than a slogan. And then I started to see it in my mind's eye, not just one bed, but a full blessing room for the family, for that mom who's in an abusive situation, who has two young kids that's got to get out today out of a scary situation, and she knocks on the door, and I got nothing. Well, now we say, you can stay here for the night till you find a safe place. Or those orphans, or those widows, or that missionary who's on furlough that has a family that has nowhere to stay. Well, now they do. Or that church member who's Heat and AC just broke for the eighth time, and you're about to put down $130 to go stay at that. Don't do that. Come stay here. It's your church. Stay here for free till you get that fixed. You see where this is going? These are just, and we have one, maybe you have two, and it has a private bathroom, and somebody can come in, and you can book it. You got people that you know need a place to stay or somebody that needs a, an anonymous shelter place to get away. The church should be doing that. Y'all, I'm going to say something that's going to make some of you mad. If the church did their job, the government wouldn't have taken over so much of this. Do you know that? Shame on us. It was never intended to be that way. We have dropped the ball, and we're taking love back. 
We're putting it back where it's supposed to. And then it dawned on me. I was like, when you have your own building in your own parking lot, you don't have to ask permission to do amazing ministry community adventures. You can bring in things like this and park it there. You don't have to ask the landlord and get declined. You can bring that in. And then you can do this right here and offer the free dental cleanings that they bring in. They're just waiting. Or this, have the health screenings where people can come and get their blood pressure taken. Potter's Hand is known as a place where they actually care about people and they do more about it. You could come. If you're not needle phobic, you can come and give your blood. But it's not just about getting poked with scary needles. There's good stuff that can happen. Like you can come and get your oil changed and we can set up a date and tell the community, hey, if you're a single mom and you're tough or you're really not good with cars, I'm just saying that can happen, guys. It can happen. Then bring your car and we'll pay for the first 50 that come through that day. There's just so many options. And you see, when you own your own parking lot, you can portion it off and protect it and make it a safe place where the kids can go burn off some energy, <coughs> Milo, and have some, some good, clean place to play where the cars don't get shattered and scratched when they're parked out back by the youth area. We won't go there, but <laughs> I'm just saying, where you can have athletic leagues because this great quote that I told you last time about Billy Graham when he said, a coach will impact more young people in a year than the average person can in a lifetime. And some of you are coaching teams and you got to drive to another city to do it. Well, maybe not anymore because there is so much. The time will come where people won't come to your church building for your church 1030 service. It's too intimidating. Gone are those days where everybody assumes everybody goes to church. But they will go to your ball game and they will meet you. And they will see, these people aren't freaks. These people are kind of nice. They seem to actually have a genuine concern for me. And they will invite them. And you can see simple fields like this have multiple purposes. Next to that, you can have picnic tables and maybe a grill or a barbecue pit, some horseshoes or some cornhole or corn row or whatever it's called where you're throwing the beanbags around. And while we're at it, if we have 10 acres, then why don't we dream big and devote one acre or two to the fishing pond? where you can go and you can bring the kids and we can have the lock-ins here and we can fish and show everyone how awesome a fisherman you are or how awesome a fisherwoman you are. That's what I'm talking about, right? And you think, oh, that's cool. It's not very humble, but the only, thing, the only thing less humble than that would be like if like the dad got his son to lay down next to it so you could see and appreciate just how big the fish was, right? That, oh, that happened. Or... Maybe if the dad just shamelessly worked himself into a photo so you could actually know he was there and won Dad of the Year Award because he does not like fishing. I'm just saying. But perhaps the most exciting and most powerful of it all when it comes to sharing the gospel is what you can do with Backyard Bible Clubs and VBS and these crafts and local missions and discipleship. And you can have community outreaches like the one we did last year that was so wildly successful we weren't even prepared for it. When 350 people, most of them not people we had ever seen before, came from our neighborhood and got to hang out with us. And now we will be ready. And as you see in this next one, we're going to do it again on Saturday, April 8th. And it is going to be a spring fling like no other where we have bags ready. Shannon's already got them ready. You're going to see them next week where it has information about the church and every coming attraction. We've got all these things, and they can be blessed with bags of goodies. No matter what decision we make with what God is leading, every one of these options works in all three of the remaining options that God gives us. So I am so excited, but it all comes back to the same question, no matter what realtor, what loan officer, every bank asks the same question. What do you have for a down payment? Do you even have earnest money? To which my answer was always, uh, <laughs> I, got a, so I got some chapstick, I think I got $1.75, Milo, go get your piggy bank, because we hadn't started. Well, we did start. We started last September, and y'all's response was awesome. It was inspiring. We handed out these pledge cards, and they were incredible. And I think we, we may have one for the, to put on the screen, but if you didn't see it, we handed these out. My leadership team gave them out, and these came pouring back in. I mean, they, you took them home, you prayed about it. Every single one that came back, without fail, checked that top box. You notice why we put it first? Because nothing significant happens apart from prayer. It ends and it begins right there. And everyone said you'd pray. And the majority checked other boxes and said, man, I commit above my, my tithe, I'm gonna give. And some of them came in and they were children. Like this one filled out with fluorescent crayon. It said, yes, I will pray, I will commit. I will give another $10 a month. 
And this one here, written in pencil, says, I will give another $2 a month. That's awesome. You could see it clearly written in a child's handwriting. That was inspiring to me. And every one of you, most of you were checking boxes of $50 and $100 above and beyond. By the time it was all said and done, there was another $1,700 approved from your hearts every month that had come in. And just small denominations. And it was powerful. And it was so incredible that within the first 45 days, we had come up with $21,000 had come. Some of you had, yeah, you can, you can applaud the Lord for that if you want. Some, some had come up and said, hey, I don't have much, but can you take this and sell it? You know, and you all know of the story about the diamond ring that was given. I said, can you go get this appraised and, and sell it? Then someone came up and says, I have, a, I have a seed check of $7,000 I want to give you. And that came up with, within minutes. We were at $15,000, and it just kept going over the last, through November and December, up to $21,000 that had come in free and clear, which was incredible. Now, what you don't know is what's happened since then. Up until the end of January, it has more than doubled to $52,000 that have come in just in the last month. That is pretty, pretty awesome. And I am so thrilled. Amen. Some have come up and said, hey, you know what? I, I'm getting an income tax refund. Can I give a portion to the church? <laughs> yes, you can. Absolutely. Or I've got some stock that we sold last year. I need to get it in. Can I give a portion? Or an IRA you had to cash out, whatever. People are doing that, and I'm hearing all kinds of great things. So Pray about it. Here is where we are. If you haven't at least taken a card, would you pray about taking one? They're at the Welcome Center. As you leave today, you can take one, fill it out, put it in the treasure chest. Notice there is no place on the card for your name because it doesn't matter. What matters is between you and the Lord. If you just let us know what we can expect, we can begin talking to the bankers and showing a history and a track record. That means everything to them to show that we are legitimate. And then if you haven't, Already, consider giving an extra special portion, whether it's your above and beyond your tithe or, or a one-time act, something with your windfall that you didn't expect, whatever. If you'll just pray about that, just check that box and let us know, okay? There's no, no need for a name. This is completely between you and the Lord. It's anonymous. Your simple affirmation is enough, and just put them in the treasure chest, okay? God is doing some amazing things, and I can't wait to see what the future holds. I truly believe with everything in me, 2017 is going to be the best year we have ever seen together, the most amazing one. Now, I see I've used up all my time, so we're going to do something a little different today. After I pray, if you can remain while the food is being set up and ready to eat, and the celebration really jacks up into high gear, we're going to put together, Ryan and Jennifer have put together an incredible seven-minute slideshow of our past history together. And it is awesome. We're going to have some music playing. If you need to get up and go to the bathroom, wash hands, you can. But I'm going to pray. And uh, Andy, tell us what we need to do here so the celebration continues. I know we need to maybe move the front row only this time. Is that? Okay. So um, I said this is a joke earlier, but I am your food attendant today. Yes. Tables. We'll bring those here and put it so the food will be along the front. Nice. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank Priscilla and Annie for putting this together. They did a great job. You guys are awesome. Love you. All right. So I am so excited. By the way, if this is the last chance I get to see you before it gets really, really crazy and we start stuffing food in our mouths. Don't miss Wednesday night. We have our first ever talent showcase, and it is going to be awesome. Come this Wednesday night. It won't surprise me if this place is packed because your kids and some adults are doing some great things. It's a dinner theater, okay? Show up at 6 and eat. 6.30 to 7.30 is going to be awesome, okay? Let me pray for us, then we'll do the slideshow and we'll eat, okay? God, you are so good to us. Thank you for 14 amazing years. 
Thank you for giving us the privilege to see you move. We join you where you're already at work, and we take no credit for it. It is all you. May we always be an awesome reflection of your glory. God, I thank you for this wonderful church, for the day that it represents, and I thank you for the food and all the hands that have prepared it. Would you bless this time? Let this fellowship be awesome. Glorify yourself even as we eat. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.